just for those of you who haven't come across the Heritage Trust Network before, we're the UK's umbrella organisation for not-for-profits that are rescuing, restoring and managing um, historic buildings, places, um, structures all around the UK. Um, we've got members, about over 650 members now, um, all across the UK from the likes of the Landmark Trust and Wentworth Woodhouse through to small local organisations that are saving uh, buildings such as their local historic pub. Please do check out our website and have a look at the benefits of becoming a member and being part of this vibrant peer-to-peer -peer network. You'll see at the top of the screen, it says uh, live on Otter AI. Uh, that's our live speech to text transcript service. So if you click the link, it opens a new web, uh, window where you can read what's being said. Please do introduce yourself and post any questions in the chat box. We always love to hear where attendees are from and we'll be putting your questions to our speakers after the presentations. Um, as always, if you can stay muted while our speakers are um, speaking, that would be great. Um, we always like seeing dogs and cats, but if you can hear doorbells going, it's slightly distracting. Um, and if you don't want to appear on screen, then please do switch your webcam off as the event's being recorded. So that's enough from me. All that's left for me to say is a massive thank you to our presenters, my colleague, Sarah, and players of the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So that's enough from me. And I'm going to hand over to Pippa and Hope from Derby Museums. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm Pippa, I'm the co-production volunteer and programmes coordinator at Derby Museums. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, her, Aya, and um, you'll see me wearing blue, um, I've got my lanyard full of badges, I've got 1940s glasses and my hair tied back. And um, we've got, well, I'll let Hope introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, my name is Hope. I am the co-production volunteer and programme assistant. Um, very long title. We all have long titles here at Dub Museums. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, hers. And today um, you'll see me wearing a headset. I've got quite short hair and my classic dungaree look, which everyone knows me by at the museums. Uh, it's really nice to see you all today um, and we'll get started. So to start you off, we really want you to think back to your teenage, young adult times. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that we'd love you to think. So, yeah, Bev, if you could put the first question up. I'm sorry, the poll doesn't seem to be working. Sarah, can Ooh. you uh, get into the poll? It's come up. It's come up. Oh, brilliant. Oh. If you're not familiar with polls, well, um, it's just a uh, question for you in terms of like thinking back to your teenage years, what were you worried about? So if you click any of those that you most relate to, um, we'll see the results in a sec. Oh, we're about 80% participated, so we're nearly there. Last 10% of folk, and then I'll um, show you the results. This is so exciting. I've never done a poll before. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Here we are. Brilliant. So we've got studies quite highly, the relationship side, maybe politics and world events slightly less, appearance, and yet no doubt all of the above is the majority, um, or a little bit, or surprising, none of the above. So if you have typed kind of none of the above or something else, please do share in the chat. So um, I don't know yourselves, but I remember very clearly uh, back my teenage years in terms of kind of like the Indian Ocean tsunami or the 9-11, the, the kind of things that have just stuck in my mind and they're clear as, as if they were yesterday. Um, I was thinking about studies, I was thinking about um, relationships, the way that I looked. I had so much on my plate to, to think about and it might be that 
you might have experienced the same. The other question coming up, if we could. is as a teenager, did you feel seen, heard, able to speak up or all of the above? Very speedy this one, that's 80% already, last 10 folk or so. Last few people. Okay, I'll end the poll and share the results. So here we go, that there's that, that double. So they're um, all of the above or none of the above. So um, I think that that really reflects kind of like how valuable our own teenage experience are in terms of how we see heritage. Um, so um, I've had a re, you'll see in a second from the presentation, I had an absolutely brilliant experience through my teenage years um, that, that has been what I wanted to translate into my work with young people today. And uh, ideally, uh, we can bring our own experiences, we can uh, relate to how we felt back in the past and try and either improve those experiences if you were a teenager today, or um, really carry those positive experiences through. So yes, just an initial exercise to think back, to reflect, and again, demystify what it is to be working with young people because you were a young person as well, or you are a young person as well. So we have got lived experience of what it's like. So um, if we could start off the presentation, be helpful. So voila, here are some photographs of me uh, back when I was 13 years old, uh, when I started volunteering at um, an 18th century naval hospital in the in the harbour of Marne in Menorca in Spain. So it's not the same as uh, volunteering in the UK. As you see, there's boats packed full of people standing up so that we could cross the harbour. Uh, not really health and safety um, conscious. We've also got me kind of clearing rubble at the age of 13, 14. Um, and you'll see from my attitude, I kind of, sometimes I've got like really crossed arms and really shy and really timid, but uh, I felt really part of a, of a team. I felt that I could see the, uh, like the progress of the project. I felt listened to, I felt, um, I just felt wonderful. And um, it kind of guided me to what I'm doing today. So thanks to this positive experience in heritage, I went on to study history and heritage. I did my dissertation about this 18th century naval hospital. And here I am now coordinating volunteers at Derby Museums. So if there's anything that we'd like you to get out of the presentation today is that we'd like you to connect with your teenage side um, to understand that whilst the context is slightly different, we can still try to relate to the feelings, to the emotions, to the wishes of today's teenagers and young people. And it's so important that we do that. Um, a little, about, a little bit about us at Derby Museums is that we are a charitable trust that was established in 2012. Um, it, our main aim is to care for the collections of the cultural heritage on behalf of the city's council and the people of Derby. And as of yesterday, we were able to announce that we've been put forward, shortlisted for the Museum of the Year Awards. And also keep your fingers crossed for us as tonight we hope to hear if we've been successful at any one of the three um, nominations that we've had for best visitor experience, fundraiser and 
um, best permanent exhibition. So yes, keep your fingers crossed. To give you a little bit of an idea, we look at the home, the city and the world through the three museums that we've got. So we've got a Georgian house in Pickford's, uh, Pickford's house that looks at that homely feeling. Um, we've got the, the city, Derby, and the first factory of the world and how that influenced across the world at the Museum of Making that just opened last year. And then we've got the Museum and Art Gallery that is basically how, thanks to um, the Industrial Revolution, we're able to collect collections from across the world and also have the important figure of Joseph Wright with 400 of his pa paintings. So it's the biggest collection um, nationwide about it. So we'll be looking at uh, Joseph Wright a little bit more um, further on. But we do things differently at the museum. So we believe that we are a place of encounters um, somewhere where people can look at the world differently. We want to kind of break expectations of what the museum is and can be, and we've got different methodologies to do that. Um, so one of them is that, well, the main one is that we operate within a person-centered approach. And that means that we do things with people rather than for people. And here you'll see a simplified version of the human centered design, which is one of the methods that we are underpinned by. And the idea behind it is that we think, we feel and we do. And we, we follow this structure throughout everything that we do in order to get it right. So we start at the start in terms of defining what we want to do. Who are the people that we want to uh, involve? It's kind of like the ideas session. Um, we also need to understand why we want to be doing that. And then following that process, we start thinking in terms of how to turn it into actions. So what are our ideas? And once we've got those ideas, can we test them out? So before investing loads of money into that, those ideas, we prototype them. So um, we try them out. If they work, brilliant, move on to the next stage, which is the test and evaluate. And if they don't work, well, through that test and evaluation that demonstrates that we go back to stage one, thinking again and defining what we want to do. And it's kind of like a circle. And then hopefully by the end, we've got a product that we can all be proud of sharing. So um, this is one of the methodologies and within it as well, we've got empathy maps. So empathy maps are all about putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. So it's organized so that we kind of consider all of the senses and the thoughts. It's important that we are specific in terms of who we're thinking about. It's not, it's not, uh, it, it, it doesn't help to create groups of people. We need to think about specifics. So we create the story of a certain person. So demographic, the age, the background. So it's not about creating assumptions or stereotypes, which is one of the dangers that could be um, used in terms of like using the empathy map. It's just really a way of, as the empathy map says, it's empathizing with the person and making sure once we've done this to listen to the people with the lived experiences so um, it's one starting point it, it goes back to that first stage of defining um, who we are trying to appeal to and then I'll pass on to my colleague Hope but the next stage really as well another one of our tools is the how might we question there you go Hope Thanks, Pippa. Um, so put ourselves in the shoes of, of Derby Museums uh, a few years ago when we started our Young Co-Producers Network project for Joseph Wright, which I'll go into in just a moment. But we've done our empathy maps. We've decided that we want to work with a group of young people um, and we want to invite them into our museums to look at how we were showing our Joseph Wright work. A big part of human-centred design and that person-centred approach is you'll hear the language use of how might we. Um, so it's just a way of framing questions that allows for positive collaboration, it opens up conversations and it allows you to build on other people's ideas and work. 
So going back to working with young people in that human centered approach after empathy mapping and thinking about how young people were feeling in our spaces, we asked ourselves, how might we reinterpret the Joseph Wright Gallery with a group of young people? My slides have stopped working for some reason. There we go. So the Joseph Wright Back to the Drawing Board project was part of the Royal Academy 250 celebrations. We worked in collaboration with artist rooms and the intended outcomes are just written below. So for young people, we wanted them to have an increase of knowledge, skills and confidence. Obviously, a lot of museum projects, that's one of the, the top aims is to get young people feeling like they have their say, going back to what we were talking about earlier, feel that they are seen and that their story is heard within their local museum. We wanted to raise aspirations. We wanted to introduce an understanding of co-production and museum practices within our museums. Practical applications of STEAM, so uh, STEM, but with arts included within that too. We wanted them to feel like an active citizen and more importantly, above everything else is also to have fun as well. Um, you know, we all know as teenagers, you know, if there's a project you don't want to do, you will grumble the entire way through it. So we wanted them to have a good time while they were doing it and feel that the museum was a space that they hopefully wanted to return to as a result of the project. For Derby Museums, we obviously would then have young people having an input into Derby Museums practices. It would support our mission to um, increase the profile and understanding of Joseph Wright, widening the relevance and access to young people and young visitors throughout the museums, develop a better understanding of our audiences and young people, and also develop staff and volunteer skills. One of the greatest things about working with young people is that we can learn from them. Um, and they will so often see things that we would never have even thought of looking at our galleries as well. So that's also a really important part of the project. So at Derby Museums, we can sometimes be a little bit guilty of thinking that everyone knows Joseph Wright. So for those of you who don't, uh, we just have some introduction to his works just here, which you can look at. Um, he's obviously an incredible painter. <laughs> we are, we might be biased, but he is. Uh, his sketches and paintings embody a spirit of discovery uh, and obviously looking at 18th century enlightenment as well. So he's painting science, experimentation, emotion. Um, he very often painted portraits of enlightened men um, and people of industry and learning and their families as well. Uh, so here we have a philosopher giving the lecture on an orrery in which a lamp is put in place of the sun, which is the bottom left just there. We have the alchemist in search of the philosopher's stone, which is on the right hand side. And we also have the widow of an Indian chief watching the arms of her husband. So um, all paintings in which the lighting is very atmospheric. Um, you know, he highlights faces and emotions um, and they are really, really incredible works. And if you haven't seen them before and you are able to get down to Derby, I do highly recommend that you come and have a look at the works. So getting back into the Young Co-Producers Network project. The recruitment for the project consisted of contacting a group of young people that we'd already worked with and had been involved with Derby Museum's programme before. We got four people joining the project that way. And then we had a further five that were recruited through contacting Derby College and Derby University as well. Um, we also included some staff as well from the Visitor Experience team as they just graduated uh, quite recently and they were interested in the idea of reinterpreting the Joseph Wright space. And it felt important to us that they obviously were, were able to have their say within their work, place of work as well. Two weeks before the project launch, we were spent getting to know the young people, um, getting to understand the knowledge that they had of Joseph Wright already and also what they wanted. So going back to that human centered approach, we didn't want to come forward to them with uh, you know, a set output of, okay, we want a soundscape or we want a new written set of, of work that people can pick up and read. Instead, we said, what would you like to see? What do you know about Joseph Wright already? What would you like to know? Is there a reason that you have a gap in your knowledge perhaps? You know, and talking to them about what they would like for young people in that space. We had Lucy Bamford, who's the senior curator of art and the Joseph Wright collection, who would give the group information about Joseph Wright, uh, his life, the times that he lived in, the way that he worked, as well as obviously the more emotional um, side of his life, what he went through as a person, um, difficulties as working as an artist in the time that he was working. They were taken through the gallery and they were asked to honestly critique it. Obviously, we can't be too precious. And um, we do have to take everything they say on board. And so they told us what they did and did not like. Um, 
quite difficult to start at first, a lot of people being very polite, but the more that you start to question and open it up, young people generally will give very honest feedback about what is not working in a gallery space. And I'll go into that a little bit more later as well with what they told us. On the left, you'll see an image just asking what Joseph Wright means to, to young people, which is the question we proposed in those two weeks. And we had thoughts beginning with uh, being proud of Derby, it opens up Derby's history. And then as we started to unpick it more, it became more about talking about his resourcefulness, about his use of art as activi activism, and also newfound respect as well, which was really interesting. So the more they found out about Joseph Wright from Lucy, and the more they found out about how he worked and how difficult it was for him, the more they began to see him as a person and respect what he did. Um, week two consisted of visiting the Joseph Wright Study Centre as well, which is another space on the top floor of our museum and art gallery space. It's a collection of sketches and items belonging to Joseph Wright that we've um, collected over the years. And they got to see things that normally would not be on public display, such as a mourning ring that Joseph Wright had. And again, it's about showing him as a person. It's about introducing his, his items that he actually held and touched. And it created that connection um, between the young people and Joseph Wright to the point where they actually started calling him Joe as well, which I really liked. So instead of Joseph Wright, he became Joe to them. He became human, which was really important. So Back to the Drawing Board was an eight week project in total. Uh, it had weekly sessions run after school on Wednesdays at 5.30 to 7.30. So with young people, obviously, it's really important to find an accessible time and space for them to come and uh, give their time with us. So staff that regularly attended the sessions were the curator of art, Lucy Banford. We had a member of staff from the learning team, a session facilitator who would come every week, and then later on, we were joined by our new head of interpretation and display as well. So we had a really high um, staff input. And then that was obviously reflected with the young people felt that they were um, being listened to. They had, you know, really interesting members of staff that they could question and talk to, which was really important. The first four weeks of the project were spent critiquing the gallery, further investigating Joseph Wright's personal items in his personal life and experimenting within the gallery. So we've got this incredible picture here where we turned all the lights off in the, um, the museum space. They had torches and they were invited to go around the gallery and pick up things that they were interested in. So where the torch would stop and where in the paintings were drawing interest. Again, just going back to that part about having fun. So, um, you know, you've got to experiment and you've got to be a little bit silly sometimes and it really works. So. Young people were immediately asking us within these four weeks, why is there no signage? Why is there no gallery introduction so that people know where they are and what the gallery is about? They asked, why is the space so big? It has quite a large open floor plan area because it's mostly images on walls. So there's a lot of internal space. They asked us why the layout was the way that it was. They said the labels were off putting and that you couldn't focus on the paintings. And they also then started to get into the more emotive side of it, saying that it was difficult to get a sense of Joseph Wright as a person. He was put on a pedestal, that his work was all that you saw. You didn't know anything about him. We didn't highlight his struggles with mental health, which they thought was really important for people to know. And they highlighted that some of, we didn't highlight that some of his paintings weren't popular at the time of, of release. Uh, they thought that we needed more layered interpretation for different audiences and for different ages to access. And they also wanted to make sure that there were multiple voices within the gallery. So we must avoid telling people what to think and allow people to tell their own stories in the space. So as you can see from all of that, they really interrogated the, the space and the gallery and brought fresh perspectives to it that we hadn't thought about previously. At the halfway point of the project, we organized a trip to London. Uh, it was mainly to see the experiment of the bird uh, in an air pump, which is in the image on the left side. Uh, and it's as, well as, as well as that, giving the group the chance to experience other museums apart from our own and other interpretation to compare alongside Derby museums as well. So to go to uh, larger museums, perhaps with more funding and be able to talk about what worked really well and what we could perhaps bring back to Derby museums from that too. So the visit was planned and co-produced with the group and venues were arranged according to their interests and suggestions. So in the morning, the whole group visited the National Gallery, which is the image we can see on the left. Um, to see that Joseph Wright painting there. And in the afternoon, we split into two different groups depending on interests. So we had one visiting the Institute of Contemporary Art and the other group visited the London Transport Museum. 
It was important for us to place Joseph Wright as a national individual, which is why we went to the National Gallery with everyone, but also important that everyone felt that they could do and direct um, what they wanted to go and see as well and, and see interpretation that they thought would interest them. It allowed them to be more critical and obviously see for themselves what worked and what didn't and bring that back. So at this point, we were reaching Christmas time. Um, before the Christmas break, the young people reviewed and shared their experiences that they'd had in London. And the consensus was generally that they enjoyed the interactives and the immersive elements of London venues, but they found large amounts of text to be quite frustrating and quite, quite boring. Um, so they didn't want that um, within the Joseph Wright Gallery. And they also found the lack of orientation quite frustrating as well. So not knowing what gallery they were in or what the theme was, was something that they didn't like. Another difficult part of working with young people, as I'm sure you all know, is that at this point, due to school workload, we then had to make some decisions. So half of the group decided to start the project again in February, which was later than we originally intended. And this was due to uh, basically mock exam period, a lot of young people starting to feel quite worried about their exams and about academics and applications for college and things like that. So half of them made the decision to join us a bit later. The other half decided to carry on um, coming on those Wednesday evenings and they would try new things in the Joseph Wright Gallery, such as music and soundscapes, digital apps and also covering the interpretation, this is one I really like, and asking the public what they would like to know. <laughs> so rather than giving the information, interrogating uh, the members of the public to say what would you like to know, because it, it might not be here and we can then later add to it, which was really great too. So in February, the whole group came back together and shared what had happened in the prototyping sessions. They found that music was very popular, um, as well as digital elements such as maps as well. The new head of interpretation joined the group in February, um, obviously bringing some really interesting perspectives on, um, on her own views. Um, she'd come from the British Museum and so, you know, had a huge wealth of knowledge that she could share with the young groups. Uh, we made a, an empathy map as well for young people who might be coming into the space or visitors who might be coming into the space and what they might like to see um, and what they might like to experience. And this is drawing on all of that knowledge of their own experience within the Joseph Wright space, their experiences in London, and also the um, asking of the public what they would like to see and also playing music and things like that. So together they began to form a brief for a new uh, set of interpretation. The major themes of the brief were creating pride in Derby, local heritage, mental health issues, contextualizing the gallery space and humanizing the artist, and also talking about Joseph Wright as a trailblazer of his time as well. The participants were aware of the budget restrictions. There was limitations of the space and logistical challenges, which we shared with them all. Uh, we felt it was really important to take them through the process exactly as members of staff would and work with them to overcome these challenges that they might have. So we worked together as a team to problem solve and think creatively to reach the desired outcome um, within the limits of the gallery space and cost as well. Uh, one of the wonderful and really powerful ideas that came from a participant as well um, was to hang an empty frame to denote periods in Joseph Wright's life when he had poor mental health and was unable to make work, which, as you can probably tell by now, was a really interesting theme that they kept coming back to was the idea of, of um, you know, the working artist not making work because he was going through depressive episodes. So the brief was created with Creative Core. Uh, it's a design company and we worked with the group to choose a color palette vinyl and a font the participants were also keen that the tone of the text was friendly and informal as well so again going back to that accessibility with young people we learned um, as well like i said earlier that the the group referred to joe joseph wright as joe which continues through the museum this day a lot of us now call joseph wright joe so they've changed our way of thinking and they've made him human to us as well which is really important and the outcome of the brief was this beautiful set of interpretation, which you'll see on the slide, that moves around the floor space and also has the main interpretation panel on the left as well. So it creates this beautiful flow around the gallery. Um, it's paired with the interpretation above it, which talks to you about the paintings, the medium, the time that it was made. And then there's this very human layer underneath about Joseph Wright's life, his relationship with family and friends, his um, struggles with depression and his struggles with being a working artist in the time that he was in as well. Um, so you get this beautiful all round view with this sort of, you know, very usual stereotypical gallery interpretation and then what the young people have brought to the gallery as well. 
we do sometimes play music in the space now as well, which is really interesting. Um, they made a soundscape of, of various noises that Joseph Wright might have heard while he was making work. And I am aware now that sometimes that is played in the gallery, which is really lovely. Um, there, was, there were days apparently where we were trying rap and things like that, which I also really liked, but perhaps didn't fit the space quite as well. Um, so obviously no project working with young people goes without a good report at the end. So we sent a survey out to young people for their feedback about the project and their experience being part of it. We were really hoping that one of them could be with us today to talk about their experience, but unfortunately it is uh, dissertation time for him. So he's unable to, uh, to come and give his thoughts, but he's said that he would like to next time, fingers crossed, if there is a next time of doing this uh, presentation. So um, the respondents all described an increase in their confidence from the project, from the survey that we sent out. And um, in their knowledge, they believed that to be a result of the project. They felt they were able to critically analyze exhibitions they worked well as a team and found creative solutions to design challenges as well. The young people all stated they had a better understanding of co-production and museum practices as well. And we have a quote that says, I enjoyed working with a range of people and seeing new points of view. I also enjoyed having a real input into the gallery interpretation and all the prototyping and experimenting at the start was very fun and I was sad when it was over. They described the project as fun, particularly exploring the gallery with torches and hearing different ideas from one another. Uh, they said they felt they were able to contribute and they found the project enabled them to contribute to a group design for the gallery in a fun and non-pressured environment as well. So again, going to that human-centered design outcome of, you know, we made it very clear that if it didn't quite work out, that was fine. Name of the project, we would go back to the drawing board and we would start again, you know, failure, is fine and that's a, a huge thing for young people as well I would say is, is that pressure to get it perfect straight away um, which comes from that exam mindset in, in museums it's really lovely to be able to break that down and say it's not worked that's fine how can we go back and start again or take what we know and bring it back around. Uh, so for Derby Museums, the outcomes for us, the young people's involvement in the project has meant that we have a fresh interpretation, perspectives on Joseph Wright that we might not have had otherwise or very likely to not have otherwise, and a gallery space that we would not have been able to come up with on our own. We gained a deeper understanding of Joseph Wright through co-research with young people. And the new interpretation aims to present Joseph Wright, his work and his importance in the story um, of British art, um, with a clearer and more engaging way and more accessible to different people, which was the, the intended aim of the project. We hope our visitors will benefit from the new interpretation, and they already have. Um, we've obviously had loads of comments in the years since this project has happened, but how people have discovered new things about an artist and how they liked the fact that it was a personal and a practical approach as well for the interpretation. We have less extensive text on the panels now, and it's more creative mediums of communication, so that beautiful river like interpretation through the gallery and it's obviously helped us to develop a better understanding of our younger audiences simply by listening to their critiques it can be difficult can be a little bit heartbreaking if that project is your baby <laughs> i've been there i've done it with young people and just gone oh goodness me that's that's hard to hear but it's so important that we listen and we listen to their critiques of current interpretation and gain a better understanding of how they want to engage with art how they want to engage with objects and different themes that are current as well we have obviously been able to develop the skills of our volunteers as well by encouraging, encouraging and facilitating critical analysis of the exhibitions and museum spaces, working with members of staff and working together to find creative solutions. So the lessons learned is that flexibility is key. Obviously, it became more difficult as the project went on to keep the group of people um, coming back to us each week because life gets in the way. You know, all those worries we talked about earlier, they all get, get in the way. Uh, have a set aim and direction, but not necessarily an outcome is important as well. And finally, that collections and historic spaces have power. So one participant said getting to handle the objects was a really good addition um, to the project and it helped us understand Joseph Wright as a person. So use your spaces and use your collections for power. And that is it. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry for running a little bit over with all my talking. No problem at all. That was absolutely fascinating thank you so much to both of you um i absolutely love the, the fact that joseph wright's been brought back to life through these young people for you the people that are working with these artworks every day um i, I suppose you can tend to get a little bit you know it's, it's an everyday thing when you're working with these objects 
projects um, and this name. Um, so that was just a, a really nice thing to hear. So um, without any further ado, I will we'll hand over to Kate Dara from The Ridge, who is up in Dunbar in Scotland. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Bev, um, and thanks for inviting me along today. Um, hi, everybody. I don't know if um, many of you know where Dunbar is. Um, we're about 30 miles to the east of Edinburgh, um, and uh, we are a, um, a small community charity with a social enterprise construction company that was set up to try and address some of the issues of rural isolation, access to support and training, uh, and so on in, in Dunbar and the surrounding area. Um, and what, what we do and the, the people that we work with is very different from um, the, the Derby Museum setup, uh, but it was fascinating to hear about that and, and so interesting to hear some of the sort of principles behind um, what, what's being achieved there and that are driving your work there. I was really interested to see the, the slide talking about raising aspirations, skills and confidence and knowledge, because really if we had to summarise what we're trying to do with with uh, our work with young people that would be a very good um, a summary of a lot of what that's about um we talked about being active citizens again that's a really key uh, aspect in our community setting um that we find is it engages youngsters and keeps them engaged um and really works in a, in a sort of small community uh, setting and fascinated as well to hear you talking about um their feedback and then how enthused they were about being able to contribute because I think that's also an absolutely key aspect for us. So um, I'm going to try and share my um, my screen. I'm not very good at this, so it may go horribly wrong. Um, hopefully not. Here we are. OK, so um, the, the, as I say, the focus of uh, the Ridges work is, is kind of different to the extent that we're about trying to create opportunities um, not just for young people, but today we'll be talking about the young people, for people locally who are really struggling and people who need help to fulfil their potential. Um, it, it's really about trying to meet those, those gaps and needs locally by taking advantage of opportunities that present themselves. And the opportunity that we, um, we, we weren't set up deliberately as a heritage focused organisation, but the opportunities we've been presented with have been a, a very rundown conservation area where the sites where we have found um, opportunity have been neglected, um, garden spaces and buildings that are very ruinous in most cases, that there's been really no other plan um, or, or prospect for the restoration of. And so we kind of built this model where we're, we're supporting people to rebuild their own lives and to build skills and to build confidence and all those um, positive things. And uh, through the rebuilding of the local uh, historic built environment, also garden environment, as well but you can see this this garden waste ground on the the left that was uh, over time turned into that lovely community garden on the right there and that there's a um, a boundary wall the medieval um, boundary wall that the mostly young people were involved in rebuilding um, and we found that the impact on their personal lives on the how they felt about themselves and um and and physically emotionally the impact that had on them was absolutely dramatic so um can I go to the next slide? Why is this not moving? OK, so um, back more closely is the, the set of ruined buildings at the head of that garden uh, behind the high street. And we could summarise those buildings as being unwanted, unvalued and dismissed. But we could also summarise the, the folk that we're working with um, in the, with those same words. And so it is a really closely linked uh, journey that the, the sites take with the folk who are involved with them. And we have a number of different um, sort of levels at which we work with people and a number of, of different sort of formats that we work with young people as part of that process. So back to the garden um, side of things, over a number of years, we've offered opportunities informally for school groups to come over the space of a year funded we you know we found funding elsewhere and the schools were very thrilled to give the opportunity to youngsters who were struggling in school to come and do some gardening 
<clears throat> and then um, uh, uh, after a number of years of that, as I said, about the garden wall, it became apparent that there was this great opportunity to, to, to teach people skills in stone masonry. And then um, after that, we moved into joinery as well as part of the building of the rebuilding of the boundary walls, but also this, um, this set of close ruins, which are um, 17th, 18th century. Um, and on the right hand side of those pictures there, you can see the, the building that is actually on the left um, and centre that in its it, the process of rebuilding and all of that was done by um, mostly young people who have none of them any background in stonemasonry or joinery or anything else and they have in the process of um, of, of the, the the restoration they've learned those skills and we've ended up um, employing We've now got nine people employed as modern apprentices um, and they are all at different stages on their journey. All but two of them are, are youngsters. We have two senior apprentices as well. And in the ground floor of that building, you can see in the centre there now that's what's there. So an open to the sky ruin that now contains a joinery workshop. And this is another group of youngsters that we also work with who are coming to us from across the county, secondary school pupils who are coming to do accredited um, training. Uh, we are accredited with the Scottish Qualifications Authority to deliver training in rural skills or gardening. Um, and in construction and these youngsters are learning here joinery, they also do bricklaying um, and stone masonry. So um, the next slide I. Um, and we were asked to talk a little bit about how to how to engage young people um, and uh, how to interact with them. And I was trying to think about uh, summarising what there were, were some of the key elements. And so this was what I came up with. Give them fire, <laughs> power tools and music. Um, so. Uh, in all seriousness, this is a fantastically engaging thing to do with young people, to give them um, a chance to take risks and to do things that they would never get to do in school. Um, and it just so happens there have been quite a lot of opportunities to play with fire. Obviously, it's all very carefully risk assessed and um, controlled and done in very safe circumstances. But that this is not school. This is kids coming out of school um, who are really not enjoying and thriving in school, doing stuff which is normally absolutely forbidden. Um, but we know young people love love to take risks, and getting to do that in a in a controlled, safe environment is actually a fantastic way to get these youngsters who are really marginalised, really struggling to engage, um, actually really enthused about attending and getting involved. And you can see here as well. Um, that they're, they're the ones that are doing the clearing of this waste ground. Um, and so that brings us on to um, my next point, which is about giving them responsibility for real change. Um, and the, that, that was the Backlands Garden. This is the Sanctuary Garden, which is on the other side of a public pathway through from the high street to the co-op supermarket. And a lot of people walk by here and see these youngsters who are youngsters that you would normally cross the road to avoid. Um, they, they're sort of seen as being the scary kids who cause trouble locally. Uh, and here they are clearing this historic site and creating a beautiful garden. And so people stop and talk to them over the wall, ask them what they're doing comment positively on um, um, on what they're doing to improve the local townscape and the kids are just like little flowers in the sunshine opening up under that positive attention and feedback that they're getting and the pride that they took in this project was just phenomenal and um, so they emptied 18 uh, well sorry filled 18 skips by hand barrowing rubble out of the site we obviously helped them a bit um, and then they worked with a dementia carer group uh, to design this garden, which they then, following the advice of the, um, the older folk, they um, designed and planted this garden, which is now used by everybody. It's open constantly to the public. And they are so proud of it. And the, that transformation in how they felt about themselves was absolutely lovely to see. So, um, as I said, you know, what, what we're doing is possibly, the, you know, in part, not there's not a lot of crossover with so many of you. I don't know how many of you do get involved in accredited training, but for us, that's a really important thing about something about status 
um, for these youngsters, also in terms of their families and the school that is willing to, to refer them, but having, having qualifications. And I'm, I'm really not for handing out, um, you know, sort of gold star certificates to them as if they're in primary school, but this is about they actually get a qualification that's really worth something really valuable uh, at the end of the day. And these are these are um, youngsters who are not succeeding in school. We had the, the middle photograph there. That was um, the first effort at doing some lettering that one of the boys. Oh, I see I've got an upside down picture. I don't know why that's happened. Sorry. Um, anyway, go back to the back to the uh, lettering. This this lad it was a big boy who was I found out a kickboxer um, out of uh, out of school time, but an absolute nightmare at school, uh, as he said himself. He said, uh, "I'm useless at everything at school, and I'm you know I have no skills." And he was nearly in tears this day after he'd done this because um, he said, actually, I, I'm going to tell them, I'm going back to school to tell them, OK, I have got skills. And who knew I was an artist? And he got me to photograph him holding this stone up so he could show his mum, because she also had kind of subscribed to this, you know, well, obviously hasn't got any skills apart from kickboxing. And he, over the, the, the period that we had them over the year, also showed incredible skills as a leader in within the team that he was working with. Um, so I think um, the, the, the status of what they're doing and the chance to do something different that's not like school that allows them to experience success um, and that also feels like it's real um, is, is really valuable. And you can see in the top right there um, repairing the wall. So again, it's about they're, they're doing something real to restore the site that they're doing their training on and, and they can come back forever after to see that bit and show people, show family and friends that they've they were the one that did that. And down at the bottom right hand corner, also in terms of the real world context, that's um, the leader of our local council and um, people from a tier one uh, construction company who had uh, who were building houses in Dunbar and had as their community benefit contribution um, donated the materials and um, tools and so on for, for this uh, school group. And so they came and they met the youngsters. And again, for the youngsters, this was like attention that they never normally get. This was also contact with adults who were saying, well, guys, if you screw the nut, as they say, and um, work hard here, and show that you've got um, the right attitude then you know you can come and work for us and so it's that real world kind of there's a there's a, a sort of context to it I think that um, that is very powerful um, also I think in, in terms of the relationships that we've built locally and, and again this may or may not be of relevance depending on the scale of what you're doing uh, I think in, in terms of getting good mixes of youngsters in, of getting, um, of being able to understand how to work around the timetables and um, profiles of groups that are, are around, um, it really helps to have good relationships with schools, after school clubs, the guides, the scouts, whoever it might be. And these were two groups that came during activities week, which is when um, senior pupils are off doing exams and they try and provide interesting things for youngsters to do and sometimes quite struggle. But the kids absolutely loved doing this. These were sort of 13, 14 year olds that came, um, the top two photos was a foraging group, sea fire again. Um, and, uh, they were they were out foraging then they came to the garden and harvested some produce and cooked it um and it was it, it was a way to engage them as well as part of our community engagement around the heritage of the site talking to them about you know so do you know what do you know about and how do you think that um people used to used to operate in this space because we talked to them about how people had their businesses in the close buildings and lived above them and then everyone had access to these rig gardens and so they were learning about you know growing food and cooking food and socializing and so on and that they really enjoyed it. And I think that aspect of fun that um, that was being talked about earlier is really important as well. Uh, so in the bottom middle there, this was again, this was about, you know, learning about what people might have done with 
with plants growing in the garden and the sort of knowledge that people used to have about plants, these girls were making cream, so hand cream and face cream from plants that they'd foraged from the, the just immediate area and from the garden. So that was that was another really successful hands on thing to do, but built on the fact that we had these great relationships um, across the school who came and said, you know, we've got this coming up. And what can what can we do? What can the Ridge do to provide something for these youngsters at that point? So um, progression routes um, and, and role models are both really important. I've talked about the, you know, the notion of um, the, the businesses that come and talk to youngsters about the possibility of moving forward. We also have really good links with colleges and um, so on that talk to them about how they can take their skills into formal training. We can talk to them about opportunities there might be within the Ridge for modern apprenticeships. Um, and for them to have that sense of, of seeing beyond just being school pupils in a in school setting that they really struggle in forever is, is actually quite a powerful um, way of opening up their, their perception of themselves in the world um, and, and really getting them to engage positively with, some, with something that makes them feel like actually maybe there might be a positive future ahead. <clears throat> One of the other things is having our apprentices who themselves were like these kids not all that long ago, um, having them involved in, uh, in being visible around the place, but also directly getting involved in working with them. And here you can see they're making bricks um, in the left hand one and they're mixing lime mortar in the right hand one. And for the for the apprentices themselves, it's amazing to be looked up to and to be the role models. But for the youngsters, these are people they can relate to. And um, I, I love the, the idea of, um, when Pippa was talking about the fact we all have lived experience, um, the great buzzword at the moment of being teenagers. And we can all, to an extent, recall the anxieties and um, pressures that we were under. But um, actually, you know, those who are really close to them in age for young people, are much more relatable. We are practically dinosaurs. I mean, past the age of about 25, you're a dinosaur. Um, it, you remember when you were at school, the, the year group below were hopelessly young and embarrassing, and the one the year group above you were just super cool and glamorous. And that, at that stage and age, having people near to you in, a, in age is really important in terms of relatability. <clears throat> so I think if you can have other youngsters involved in your organisation, it's absolutely fantastic in terms of, of that relatable um, aspect of, of getting um, youngsters enthused about, about whatever it is you're doing. Um, for, the, for the apprentices themselves, uh, yeah, it's absolutely confidence building and, and a great sort of step onward for them too. So just to give you a little um, story about one of our one of our apprentices, Darren, who is in the, the left top left hand photo there in his hat and um, joggers, uh, started with us back in 2014, and he was a poor wee soul um, who couldn't look anybody in the eye and never had a word to say and was involved in sort of low level, level drug taking and uh, not on a good path at all, not engaging with school at all. And he came to the garden group and was involved in cutting down trees and burning things and uh, so on, and eventually got involved in the very early stages of our war work. And he was actually our first apprentice. And you can see from Darren, who literally had not a word to say, um, this head up, smiley boy in the centre there, getting an award from the community council for being the young person in Dunbar who was considered to have made the most contribution that year to the community. And this was partly because of his building work and restoration work across the town, but also because he was being a really positive role model for other youngsters. And then top right and bottom left, that's Darren holding court with a couple of visiting Scottish government ministers. Um, we can't shut him up now. He's such an evangelist for how involvement in heritage and in his skills training has changed his life. Um, and there's a lovely piece of carving that he's done in the middle. And on the right hand side there, he is um, very proudly showing off a piece of his work high up in the sky. Uh, and Darren is now working as um, alongside one of our senior trainers as a trainer with with young people coming in. And I think that's, a, again, it's just a hugely powerful thing to get youngsters um, involved as ambassadors for your for your organization if you have anybody that you can see coming through 
um, and to, to, to use them. And, and it's a, it's a two way street. It benefits them. It benefits the other youngsters. It benefits your project in terms of, of, um, of engagement. So, um, I don't want to, to read all of this to you, but this was some of the, some of the things that when I, oh, sorry, wrong button. Um, when I was trying to sort of summarize my thoughts about, about engaging with young people, um, and Bev had mentioned, you know, even things like how to talk to them. Um, and I was thinking, you know, it, it's, it's funny when we think about young people en masse, it can be a very scary prospect. Um, and big groups of them can be um, overwhelming and, and, um, and feel quite hostile, I think. And it really, you know, a lot of you will have different experiences of, of how, how you're engaging with young people and, and the sort of groups you get. But I do know that if you end up with a sort of a whole class visit, it can be really difficult. So I've got some suggestions there around ways to, to deal with that. But I thought actually what I would probably do was close with a little story and you can read that in your own uh, time, um, about something that happened very recently with us, which kind of illustrates um, a terrible approach and a, maybe some, some good learning as well um, in how you can turn that around. Um, so we, we at the moment have got scaffolding up on one of our gables in Blackboard Close. Um, around, it's a really quite dodgy gable that's being reconstructed and there's scaffolding on both sides. And obviously when it's not in use, the ladders are up and the gates are closed and there are signs and all the rest of it. Um, but the other day I was coming back along that garden lane from the co-op one evening and I saw kids literally on the top of the scaffolding and on top of the gable, which is really fragile. And I had a very strong emotional response and went tearing into the garden um, and ran up and was shouting at them to what earth are you doing? Get off there right now and you know, don't come back. It's really, you know, it's so dangerous. And this is the Ridges property. And I was just, I could feel my heart was, I was absolutely terrified they were going to fall off. And also, you know, obviously all the repercussions from that. So they had the very classic response kids who who are used to being shouted at and um told me where I could go um and they were not for getting down and event when eventually they did get down because I said okay I'm going to film you and I'm going to call the police and um they started throwing stones little pebbles at me as they left and I came away from it absolutely shaking with distress um, and, and really upset about the whole incident. And I came back to my flat, which is further along the high street, and sat for a little while. Oh, God, that was awful, absolutely awful. These are the kids who at the moment are, I mean, I didn't know any of them, but we'd been asked to work with these, this particular group of kids, and I'm pretty sure it was these ones, um, because they're, they're getting into trouble with the police and causing all sorts of issues locally. I've just done the worst possible thing and set up this horrible oppositional thing with them, and there's no way they're going to engage well. And it's what an awful thing to do, because we're meant to be here for the community and for those who are struggling so anyway I looked out of my window and there they were sitting down below my flat these guys are like 12 13 years old sitting rolling joints <laughs> on the pavement outside my uh, my flat so I thought oh, okay well I'm going to pick my battles here I'm not going to go down and talk to them about um drugs just now but having breathed deeply and, and sort of seen very quickly the error of my ways, I went down um, after I thought they'd probably finished having their joints, and indeed they had, and I went around and said, hi, um, this is me, and that was me shouting at you, and um, sort of hunkered down on the pavement with them, and they said, uh, and I said, oh, they looked a bit astonished, and said, I just actually wanted to really apologise to you because I realised that that was an awful way to respond. And I really am so sorry for speaking to you like that. And they said, oh, don't worry, we're used to being speak talking to you like that. That's what we expect. And I said, well, OK, but I, I'm not happy to have done it. And I just want you to understand why. And I explained to them how frightened I was that they were going to hurt themselves and how frightened I was that they were going to cause damage to the this, um, historic gable um, and everything that you know been going through my mind and one of them said oh yes and it would be do terrible things for your insurance 
<laughs> they totally got it. Um, and uh, so we had we got into this conversation, and they said, "Oh, well, we saw some we saw some stuff up there. You know, there's like these 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 things in the wall, like machines. What's that?" And we started talking about ranges and about people cooking on ranges, and they couldn't believe that people really actually used to cook on these ranges, and were just fascinated by it. And they're like, "Can we come back? Can we?" And so it ended up in this conversation where. Um, I was inviting them to come back and they, we haven't organised it yet, but they're going to come on a little visit and we're going to show them around. And, and in fact, some of them are, you know, oh, I know so and so comes to the ridge and does um, making walls and I want to do that. And and so it was completely turned around. So I, I'm, I'm just I'm telling you that story because I think it kind of encapsulates a lot of that kind of terror of the you know the crazy behavior that that youngsters can um can come up with but actually the the that interaction that personal um sort of much more respectful interaction where you listen um where you give them a chance to to actually also to to show some respect and to empathize with with your point of view and it becomes this um something really positive and and where these youngsters are now really excited I have actually seen them in the garden um where they also weren't meant to be and had a really good conversation with them there about okay could go to the sanctuary garden and that would um be somewhere as long as you're not annoying the neighbors that you could hang out and so these most most marginalized most troublesome kids are now actually looking forward to um engaging positively with with their heritage. And I was able to say to them as well, you know, the Ridge Skio, it's, it's, it belongs to the community. You're the community. This whole site belongs to you. It's your history. It's your heritage. Um, and so <clears throat> that, that whole disastrous response of mine was able um, almost to generate that, that positive conversation. Um, and so I just think, you know, for me, it just reminded me what I obviously already really knew if I wasn't all sort of hyped up that you know kids are kids are people young people they're, they're individuals they have a massive sort of instinct to to play up as part of the pack they've got a lot at stake when they're teenagers in terms of sort of social approval in their peer group and so on and often do crazy things as a gang but you know if you give them if you give them the time of day if you take the time to stop and talk and listen and show interest and um speak to them respectfully it tends to be a two-way street and i would say that that's um that's a real positive uh, way of, of engaging anybody with with heritage young or old okay so that's me thank you thank very you. much for listening thank you so much kate that was such a heartfelt presentation and your own personal story at the end i think that will really resonate with people um and I think it just goes to show that working in the heritage sector quite often, we can get quite hung up on using technology, you know, to engage with, with young people. And it just shows that sometimes if you go back to basics and give them a torch, as in Derby Museum, or give them fire and power tools, that's the way you can grab them. You don't always need really advanced technology. Um, you'll see that there are lots of comments in the chat box about the fantastic work that the Ridge is doing um, and the, the stories that you've shared. So thank you so much, Kate. Um, and I will now go over to uh, Chiara, um, who we've Trying got here from... Sharing. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> got from uh, Historic Environment Scotland, uh, Josie from Young Scott, and we've also got Charlotte, who's one of the young people that, that they're working with. So take it away. Thank you so much, Bev. Uh, this is great. It's been a fantastic event so far. Really brilliant work all around. Um, and morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Josie, for sharing the, the slides. Um, today, we'll talk to you about the Historic Scott uh, Youth Forum. I'm Chiara from Historic Environment Scotland, which is the lead public body established to investigate, care for and promote Scotland's historic environment. I'll be joined, as Bev said, by Josie from Young Scott and really delighted to have Charlotte from the Historic Scott um, Forum itself. Next, please. So um, just a very quick 
introduction uh, about the history of the project. Um, basically, it stems from decades of working with young people on heritage projects at Historic Environment Scotland. From a personal perspective, I worked on a project called Scotland's Urban Past, which was a five-year community engagement program completed in 2019. And one third of the projects, so 20 projects were actually led by young people from start to finish. And an example here you can see in the picture is um, our a work, the project that we did with young skaters in Livingston. Uh, these young people recorded this, their skate park. They really wanted to celebrate their skate park as because it's really heritage for them. And this became the first skate park to be ever added on to Canmore on the national record of the historic environment. We basically didn't even have the word for skate park, so we had to add that onto the record. And since then, many more skate park have been added onto the record. Next. So as part uh, of um, um, as part of Scotland's Urban Past, we also had the yearly youth forum um, and we had different group of young people involved in this uh, youth forum every year and the, their aim was to co-design a youth event which again it was always different every year we never quite knew what it was going to be like the picture that you see on this slide is from an event from the first event ever organized by by the scotland's urban past youth forum which was called dance through the decades um but we also had um some a storytelling event about the history of John Knox, um, an escape room uh, designed by the young people in Edinburgh, in the Edinburgh Castle dungeons, all sorts of different things. Next, please. Um, and we actually run uh, as HES, uh, many different youth-led initiatives during the Year of Young People in 2018. And the picture on the left-hand side is from Invisible Spaces, which was an exhibition that was entirely curated by young artists in the Summer Hall, and which was actually launched by our First Minister, as you can see. We also had this really huge event called Night at the Castle, which was an after-hours event co-designed uh, by young people at Edinburgh Castle. Again, as I said, organized by young people for young people with lots of concerts, neon lights. So because of this wealth of experience uh, of co-design work with young people, uh, we pondered on the legacy of this year of young people, but also really building on all these different initiatives and also on the Scotland's Urban Pass Youth Forum. And what we thought at Historic Environment Scotland was actually to establish a permanent presence uh, working with young people uh, internally. So we established an internal HES youth forum for staff. And we also worked in partnership with Young Scott. This was back in 2019 to establish what we are talking about this today, just now, the Historic Scott Youth Forum, which is the focus of our talk. Next, please. And um, Josie and, and Charlotte will tell you a lot more about this just now, but just to introduce um, to um, Historic Scott, the overall aim of this project is to improve youth participation in decision-making in heritage. And as you know, the heritage sector is um, a sector where young people are underrepresented. And with this youth forum, we wanted to listen to young people's voices and ideas, very much asking the young people directly what they are interested in, rather than engaging them after, say, a strategy or a policy is produced. So we wanted to create a safe space for young people to create, test and challenge um, ideas through a co-design approach. Currently, the Historic Scott Youth Forum is working closely with um, historic, and, historic Environment Scotland staff on a youth action plan that will be embedded in HES's operations and implemented from July uh, 2022 onwards. And now I'd like to hand over to Josie, who will tell you a little bit more about the co-design approach. Thank you so much.
Brilliant. Thanks so much, Cara. Just move the slide along. There are a little bit sleepy slides today. Okay, so I am Josie. I work for Young Scott. I'm a co-design officer at Young Scott. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about co-design in a minute. I thought it might be good just to give you a bit of context of who we are, what we do, um, before talking a bit about this particular project and then handing over to our wonderful Charlotte to talk about the forum itself and what it's like being a volunteer on the forum. So who are Young Scott? What, what do we do? Who are we? So we are a national, um, Scotland's national youth information and citizenship charity. We are for young people aged between 11 and 25 across Scotland. And we work in kind of three key different ways. So we work over three key directorates. And um, these are Inform, Connect and Empower. So our Inform uh, Directorate is as exactly as it sounds, um, informing young people um, with reliable, trustworthy information and content that will support them in their lives and help them make informed decisions. We also have our Connect Directorate, which is all about connecting young people to opportunities, whether these are local, national or global. Um, but we also have lots of ways in which we connect them um, within their individual communities as well. So a, a key a key thing that we provide is the free national entitlement card or the Young Scott card. And um, that if anyone here who's lived in Scotland themselves has probably heard of. Um, and as part of our initiative this year, we were very excited to launch the under 22s free bus travel scheme. So if you have a Young Scott card, it means that you can travel anywhere across Scotland by flashing that card at the bus driver um, and getting to, to travel all over the place with that, which we're really proud of. We have a membership platform for young people, which is also free, and this allows young people to access um, discounts and opportunities in a really easy to access, youth friendly way, essentially. And of course, we also offer a one pound entry fee to heritage sites as well, which is something we've developed through our Connect direction, which is brilliant. So young people can get a free, a free bus to their local heritage site and only pay a pound to get in, which is fantastic. And then we also have our Empower Directorate, which is what my job comes under. And it's what I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And this is all about empowering young people to create and drive positive change through our YS Hive service. So what is YS Hive? I hear you cry. Um, so essentially the YS Hive service is our co-design approach um, with young people. So YS Hive empowers young people to be system changers and influencers by sharing power with organisations and tackling society's toughest challenges. So essentially, we, uh, we partner up with young people and with partnerships to co-design um, projects to improve services for the benefits of young people, but also for the benefits of those organisations themselves. So young people actually define design and deliver on new policy changes and improvements to services. Uh, we use a range of engaging and ethical design models to do this that create the right conditions so those young people can discover insights, shape designs and improvements to unlock culture and system change. So it's a very brief overview of what YS Hive is. And so I'm just going to briefly walk you through the, the co-design model that we use um, in YS Hive with our young volunteers. So our skills, design models and tools are informed by service design methodology. And it's actually very similar to what Dar Derby Museums were talking about earlier. So there's a lot of like crossover here that you'll probably probably kind of connect to um, as well. So we have a four step process um, and a lot as Derby Designs were talking about earlier, uh, Derby Museums. This process can go back and forth and it's it, it's quite circular and there's not necessarily a time limit on it. Obviously, projects have time limits, um, but we can quite, it tends to be quite flexible where you go back and forth with this process with young people to suit what their needs are and the needs of the project as well. So the first stage would be exploring the problem. So this is framing the vision, probing at those problems, questioning stuff and finding out what the bigger picture is of the issue that they're trying to unravel. And then the young people would move into the create phase of a project where they would seek opportunities to prototype and play around with ideas, see what works, see what doesn't, test those out and dig into more of the issues um, happening in that particular project. Then they'll move into the disrupt phase. And this is where they um, probably get a chance to test out what those prototypes were that they've created, test them out in the real world, um, question um, what will happen to them in the future if they're implemented, learn from testing these ideas and seeing where they have value. And then finally is the act stage, which is where they get to share their, their learning stories, 
pitch their bold ideas and challenge decision makers so they have real influence and real system change. So ultimately, YS Hive is all about taking young volunteers and giving them not just a seat at the table, but a voice at the table and also a chance to question the decisions being made at any particular table. So I've loosely given you an idea of what it's like for us to work with young people um, and, and what we do to engage young people throughout Wales Hive, but also throughout Young Scott. So as I've already mentioned before, we provide relevant, trustworthy information through our website and our social media channels. Obviously, in a world of misinformation and fake news, this is really important for young people. Um, and it became particularly relevant and, and um, poignant, obviously, in the pandemic. We have a variety of digital platforms that we use to engage our volunteers on all our different projects. We provide support to young people to engage in opportunities. So this might be support around accessibility needs or covering the costs to allow young people to participate in the activity that we deliver. We always provide clear guidance and clear information through our volunteer handbooks. Young people have all the information before they even start a project with us. And we always have informed consent on every opportunity that we do as well. As young, at Young Scott, we have young people actually sitting on our board. They are part of our board and part of what we, we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And they guide our decision-making and question us um, all the way through, which is fantastic. We also co-design our strategy with young people as well, which has been a really great development over the past few years. We actually have young people telling us what they feel that we need to be achieving in our next three, five-year plan, et cetera. All right, so I'm going to move on to the good stuff. Um, I'm going to move on to handing over to Charlotte, who is one of our um, YS High volunteers, and she volunteers on the Historic Scott Youth Forum project, uh, which Kiara introduced you to earlier. She's going to walk you through a little intro about it and talk to you about her experience on the project. And a little shout out to Charlotte for being a legend for coming in on a wee break at work to talk to us about this. So hello, Charlotte, welcome. I'll hand over to you just now. Hello everyone, uh, yeah I'm Charlotte, I'm uh, 22, I live in Aberdeen. Um, I've been on the Historic Scott Youth Forum uh, since October of 2020. Um, I'll just kind of go through the, the slide here. So the aims of the Youth Forum are to work with heads to explore and create recommendations. Um, so it's kind of about um, creating recommendations to tackle youth engagement and heritage um, and making it more accessible uh, for young people, um, to test out the implementation of some of the recommendations, to produce an action plan for HES. Um, we, we actually have done kind of the, the first big thing, which we uh, published our report in 2021, um, which was a really great experience. So the current forum, you can see some of us in the photo there, um, it's 25 young people aged 11 to 25 um, and they're from 15 different local authority areas in Scotland. Um, I think next slide. Um, perfect, yeah. So my experience so far has been really great. Um, at every point I've kind of felt really listened to by HES. They always really they communicate with us and they give really really helpful and constructive feedback which has been really really important um in some of the work that we've been doing uh, like i said there's kind of two stages so far um like two big stages uh we've written the report and right now we're working towards um creating a youth action plan um so our report was kind of divided into various different um sections we we work in um, small working groups. My working group is um, head sites. So we are looking at making head sites um, engaging and accessible um, for young people and working on, on um, involving um, minority stories more uh, and making them more visible at head sites. Um, so for that, for uh, writing the report, we did so many different meetings. I think, I think head sites were meeting once a week for about a month, um, just just kind of trying to work through all of the stuff we had to work through, create, uh, coming up with ideas about, um, you know, helping accessibility and helping um, youth engagement. That that's a really uh, fun part. We've been we've been talking a lot about gamification, 
um, and making sites really fun for young people. Um, so writing the report itself, at first it was quite daunting. <laughs> it seemed like um, quite a, a big thing um, to do. It, it was a, it was a lot of work and you know it was a bit it was a bit daunting. Um, but working with Hez and all all of the support we got from Hez and from Young Scott um, really really made it a lot easier and it it um, it gave us an idea of what they were looking for. Hez were Hez were always really good at um, listening to our ideas and oh, sorry the lights just gone off. Um, listening to our ideas and um, giving us really constructive feedback on them and you know you could come to Hez with any idea no matter how big or small and they would really take the time um to consider it and um to consider it and you know give it give us feedback on it it was it was really great um so a big part of writing the report and the whole experience in general was collaborating online um you know it's not always the easiest thing it can be quite uh, a challenging um thing to do especially you know with a bunch of people you've never met before to come up with all these kind of mad ideas about um his sites and stuff um but um young scott staff and his staff were really really good at helping it keep helping it be like interactive and um giving us like sorry giving us space to work independently has been a big thing um so like just like on call giving us like a little bit of space to work independently and like add our ideas to like a big board or whatever that that was really good um because it, it keeps it really interactive what we're doing um and then they also like find fun new ways to like frame different activities that's been really good you know if um it it might get boring quite quickly if we just we just talked about things endlessly but we we um we find different ways to look at it and that's been really helpful in like you know thinking about it in different ways as well um the other thing that i want to talk about is the residential we had a residential um earlier i think it was april so bad at dates um but um it was so so nice to meet everyone in person and it was so productive as well meeting everyone in person we just got so much done in that day uh in that the two days um so it, it was so good to have that like uh, translate from online to in person, um, and it was really good to get the support of uh, his staff and um, uh, young Scott staff as well. Um, so we we also while we were there, we did a couple of really fun activities. We went to Edinburgh Castle, um, and we went to Camera Obscura uh, later on in the evening, um, and that was really good fun as well. Um, it also was really good in like stimulating new ideas as well. With Edinburgh Castle, I know me and Mike, uh, the other head sites people, we were all like talking about what was good and what was bad, and you know what what we thought could be improved in the, the places that we were in camera obscura as well because it's in, in edinburgh i don't know if um anyone knows it but it's like it's kind of like a, a, a optical illusions place it's really good fun um but we were thinking about like how the stuff that we were doing there could be applied in head sites so that was really good and it gave us a real a real kind of jumping off point um so the, the kind of last thing i'm going to talk about is um if it's kind of like like top tips um for working with young people on a heritage project from um what i've learned here so the first thing is like actively listening to young people and engaging with their ideas and taking them seriously that's been something that um young scott and his have been really really good at um like i said nothing you you can can't come to them with something too big it's been it's been amazing um but <laughs> um like off the back of that as well give constructive feedback because obviously we can't do everything um and it's good to have the parameters there and you know the, not just saying like that's that's we can't do that giving constructive feedback and saying we, we might not be able to do this whole thing 
but we could do this part and uh, this is a really good idea. Um, the last thing is that it's, it sounds kind of obvious, um, but it's taking young people seriously. And um, that's been really good. Um, you know, they've, they've really, really taken us and our ideas seriously every step of the way. And that's been something that's been amazing um, because sometimes like engaging in like different organizations and stuff, um, you, your ideas don't get taken seriously because you don't have whatever kind of experience or, or something like that. Um, but they always listen to us and they always listen to us. Um, they always listen to us actively. They always take us seriously. So that's been something that's been really great. Um, yeah, so it's been a great experience overall. Um, I, think that's, I think that's everything I've got to talk about. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for sharing that with us. It's brilliant to have you as part of this um, presentation. Um, I think it, feel, it feels it feels more real with a young person in a call actually telling us about what's going on and what your interpretation of it was. So thanks so much, Charlotte. Um, lovely. I'll hand over to whoever the next speaker is and stop sharing my screen. Thanks, everyone. Can I thank Charlotte as well? <laughs> not just by text. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for taking the time as well from work. I really appreciate it. That was absolutely brilliant. Again, an, another heartfelt uh, presentation. And Charlotte, you are that mythical creature that we're all looking <laughs> towards to engage. So it's been absolute gold dust having you here this morning. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, Kiara and Josie, again, um, we've had a few conversations so far about uh, setting up a, a youth forum and we're just in the early stages um, at the Heritage Trust Network. We've had an inception meeting and I think things that have come out of that for us um, so far was, as Charlotte said, taking young people's ideas seriously. I think it seems that too often they, you know, come up with these great ideas, they get really enthusiastic, and then they can be sort of batted away at the last moment and said it, told it's not possible. So it's just great to hear that, you know, such a big, important organisation, as in HES, um, are taking these people so seriously and really embedding their views strategically in, in what you're doing, and there needs to be more of that. So thank you so much to the three of you for, for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Sarah, who is going to share um, another colleague, Tessa's um, video, because she's on holiday. And Tessa's talking about um, our new Digital Heroes project that's just started, but also um, work she did with young people in her previous role uh, at the Pankhurst Centre in Manchester. Uh, so take it away, Sarah. Fingers crossed for the technology. Hi everybody, um, I'm Tessa Chenoweth. I'm the project manager uh, for a new project called Digital Heroes with HTN. Uh, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be with you today, but uh, I'm on holiday. Uh, I am hoping that you'll have seen Digital Heroes um, on newsletters and on our social media. Uh, but in case you haven't, uh, it's a project which is connecting 18 to 30 year olds with digital skills with our members. Um, so you, if you are an HTM member and are interested in engaging uh, young adults and have a digital uh, project that you're wanting to get done, uh, please do drop me a line. Uh, I will um, ask Bev to pop my email address um, in the chat box so that you have it. Um, but please do get in touch because that's something that we'd, we can definitely work together on. Um, because that's a new project and that's just getting started, I'm not actually going to be talking about that today. Uh, what I'm going to be doing instead is talking about a project that I was involved with um, in my previous role as Heritage Manager at the Pankhurst Trust. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just tell you a little bit about that project, um, hopefully share a video of one of our events. Um, and pull out a few ideas for what worked well um, and a few for what didn't. Um, and I hope that that will be helpful uh, as you go about engaging young adults in your in your work. Um, so the first thing to say is that I don't profess to be an expert in youth engagement at all. Um, 
but um, in sort of thinking about the work that I've done so far, uh, after having, you know, in preparation for this event, um, I have uh, been reflecting that, you know, most of my um, working life has been about engaging young people in, in some way. So whether that's, you know, working with students in higher education and academia, or young volunteers, um, at heritage or museum sites or younger audiences of different sorts. Um, so I think like many people working in um, and volunteering in museums and heritage, uh, we're often sort of thrown into new projects without the opportunity to kind of scope out best practice and find out how to do it. Uh, so I'm really pleased to get the chance to kind of reflect on what we've been doing um, today. So um, the project I'm telling you about today was called Rise Voice Vote, um, and it's a youth engagement project which ran uh, in 2018 um, for the Pankhurst Trust. Um, and because lots of this kind of engagement work is so organisationally specific, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Pankhurst Trust. So the Trust does two things. Um, it's the parent organisation for Manchester Women's Aid, uh, which is a domestic violence and abuse charity, which provides services for women and children experiencing uh, domestic abuse in Manchester. Uh, this is obviously hugely important work uh, and probably makes up at least 95% um, of the trust's uh, resources uh, and time. The other part of the trust mission, um, which I became kind of partly responsible for in 2018, was to save and restore the trust's headquarters um, at 62 Nelson Street in Manchester, which was the home of Emmeline Pankhurst uh, and the place where the suffragette movement began. Um, and I think when people think of a heritage property associated with Emmeline Pankhurst, you know, one of the most famous campaigners for women's rights in history, uh, they imagine a property sort of in a national trust model. Um, and I just want to sort of wind your expectations back times a thousand. Uh, so the building uh, was totally derelict when the trust took over. Uh, there's nothing original in the interior of the building and there is uh, no collection as such to speak of, although that's something that I could talk about at length. Um, the building really operates as a women's centre, although some text boards were put up with interpretation uh, written by uh, volunteers in the 1990s, and they stayed in place until last year when we managed to reopen our kind of first proper permanent exhibition um, on site. Uh, that's called At Home with the Pankhurst family and it's open now so please do uh, go and see it if you're in Manchester. Um, so the project that I'm talking about is called Rise Voice Vote uh, and it was about engaging local young people with the history of the Pankhurst family for the specific purposes of encouraging political participation today. Um, so we, we were managed to engage over 200 young people uh, through different schools and community groups for three different events which focused on the past, present and future of political campaigning. So the, the session that focused on the past was a visit to the Pankhurst Centre. Um, and this was not an easy feat. You know, we were not um, by this stage an established museum. Uh, we didn't have any members of staff uh, prior to this project and we had no education programme, uh, no health and safety, uh, nothing. We had none of that. All of this had to come through the project. Uh, the second uh, session was a session about the present, so that was an in-school um, or in uh, youth setting uh, workshop where youth workers or, or local um, campaigners went into schools and found out what the campaigns were that, that young people were passionate about today. And then we had um, the final session for the project was, um, we called it a hack day, and it was at the People's History Museum, which brought um, as many people who'd been involved in the project as possible together, you know, this was all pre-COVID, uh, and gave them an opportunity to kind of further the campaigns that they were interested um, in. So this included things uh, like um, a theatre workshop and public speaking workshop. We had social media and animation workshops. We had a podcasting workshop. We had t-shirt and badge making. Um, we had posters. We had all sorts. It was a really exciting um, day. Um, and I just want to actually take the opportunity now to show you a film, um, a very quick film. It's about two minutes. Um, if I can, so just bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, maybe that's the right one. 
There we go. 100 years on from Manchester women leading the Votes for Women campaign, how can we miss this opportunity to power up the next generation? Just to let you know, the sound does come back in a second. It's been a great programme to be involved in, being able to collaborate with other schools in Manchester and have our students working with a diverse range of students from across the city on issues that young people care about the most. It's been a really great platform for them to launch their social action campaigns. I think today I was just so incredibly impressed by the passion of the students towards their campaigns and I think also just the variety of issues that they were engaging with. So we did like podcasts interviewing people about their campaigns as well and we did making t-shirts and badges with like slogans on and also how to run an effective social media campaign like catchy tweets and gifts and things that all catch young people's attention. Today was just a really great reminder of why we do what we do and that, you know, young people are incredibly passionate and engaged if you give them the chance. Our opinions matter and that it's our world that we're going into. Uh, yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I've lost my place in my um, little document. Um, right, so as you see, it was a great day and a few things for the project worked exceptionally well. Um, and I'm just going to share those with you now. So the first is that we worked with people who knew what they were doing. Um, I would very much recommend we're partnering with an organisation. Um, we partnered with Happen Together, a community interest company, um, who not only have loads of experience of doing this sort of work, but um, also have really important connections that we just didn't have. Um, so Happen Together brought together a kind of merry band of individuals and organisations, you know, many of whom you saw on that film, um, who were involved in the project and who just really made it work. This included youth workers and educators, political campaigners, local councillors and MPs, um, and really experienced digital and social enterprises who had years of experience working with young people and, and doing these sorts of kind of political participation projects. Um, none of the activities of the project would have been possible if we were to go at this cold um, and the connections and relationships they, they brought to the project would really have been totally beyond the scope of this very short term 12 months um, project. I think part of working with people um, who knew uh, what they were doing is also to know your own strengths. Um, and weaknesses. Uh, so I worked with somebody at the Pancreas Trust who uh, was recommending somebody for an engagement role we were advertising um, on the basis that when faced with a room full of teenagers, she didn't feel, um, and I think she used the word terrified. Uh, and I think that's really good advice. You know, it takes all sorts of uh, people to run successful projects. Um, and it's helpful to kind of uh, be respectful of the skills of, of youth engagement. Um, although I do have to say that I think that there is something to be said for sort of having a go yourself. Um, but in hindsight, I wish I'd have done a skills audit at the beginning uh, and included those types of skills of kind of, you know, standing up in front of a, young, a, a room full of uh, teenagers uh, in, in that skills audit. Um, Another part of knowing our strengths was trusting in the heritage that we wanted to share. So I think it's really important to be clear about why you are interested in your particular heritage site, um, because other people will be interested in that too, and that's irrespective of age. Um, I think at the Pankhurst Centre, we were lucky um, because the history of the suffragettes is something that young people are taught in schools um, and it's a real part of young people's identity, particularly in, in Manchester. Um, because that is where the suffragette movement began. So we didn't have that particular barrier to engagement that others might have, might have done. Um, 
but actually it wasn't necessarily the things that we thought people would be interested in that they were um so we sort of assumed that teenagers would be interested in those kind of rebellious acts um of protest and maybe in the more kind of militant acts of um of protest that the, the suffragettes are, are known for and activities that might chime with the activities of kind of climate activists today for example um but lots of the young people who took part were interested in you know the colors that the suffragettes used to market themselves um, and in finding out about the different stories of the different family members uh, that they hadn't heard about in their kind of traditional histories. Um, so I don't think you can make any assumptions at all, really, um, about what young people are going to be um, interested in, uh, because they're going to be interested in different things. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm glad that we did is that we, we stood firm in our appreciation of this history and heritage. We knew that the history of the building and the family was interesting, uh, and we were clear that we wanted this project to work for the Pankhurst Centre and wanted the opportunity to bring young people into the Pankhurst Centre uh, and to use it as a way to develop our own understanding of what uh, you know, a good education offer might be at the centre. So I'm really pleased that we did stay true to that. Um, and that the workshops that we had as part of this project now form uh, the basis of our education offer at the Panker Centre. Um, uh, yeah, and that came from our confidence that this was interesting uh, and would be interesting to people of, of all ages. Another thing that worked really well is that um, was that the we provided a kind of um, a variety of different opportunities and different types and levels of engagement. Um, we weren't. And this was actually to my horror as I started as a kind of control freak uh, project management um, rigid with the, you know, the, the types of activity that each young pe person had to attend. Um, and as new um, opportunities presented themselves, you know, usually through this vast array of project partners and um, uh, external parties that we were working with, we just added those into the project. Um, so this meant that some young people were more involved in the process of the project. Um, you might have seen that the video was produced by a social enterprise um, called Sharp Futures, um, but they were also part of our um, website design team. Um, and some of the young people and their teachers and youth workers also attended some co-design sessions for the project too. Uh, others participated uh, in full with the full programme of activities and others picked and chose which bits of activity fit best with what they were hoping um, to get out of it. Um, and what this meant was that there were lots of different opportunities that kind of joined the project that we hadn't intended to at the beginning of the of the project. This included things like um, there was a launch of the TV programme, The Making of a Militant, which was about um, the background of Emmeline Pankhurst's uh, uh, campaigning. So the launch was at the Pankhurst Centre and it meant that some of the young people got to meet the actor who played Emmeline, uh, as well as the film producer and even, you know, the mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, um, which was, you know, a great event. Uh, we also had uh, some of the young people join uh, the procession from the Pankhurst Centre to watch the unveiling of the statue, a new statue of Emmeline Pankhurst uh, in St Peter's Square. And hundreds of young people, I mean, literally hundreds of young people came in coach loads uh, to the Pankhurst Centre and marched down Oxford Road uh, with their own banners and their own chants that had kind of been produced independently of the project. Um, and it was wonderful to see the heritage sort of taking on a life of its own in that way. Uh, we've also had a number of different events uh, in participation with some of our uh, project partners who were local councillors. So some of the young people got to take part in a in a in a, in a debate in a council chamber, uh, which I think was you know really really interesting for all of them. So in general, the project had some fantastic feedback, but as with any project, there were things that we we could have done better. Um, as with all projects, I'd have liked more time. Uh, the project was pulled together extremely quickly. Uh, I think it was something like three months uh, from the funding announcement to project start, which is bonkers. Um, and with hindsight, I would have liked to have had um, more confidence as a project manager to narrow down the scope of the project and to make sure that we were each partner was getting what they wanted from us from it. Um, 
there are obviously huge benefits of working with partners and i hope i've made that clear but it does mean that you're constantly juggling the priorities and expectations of others which which can be quite tricky to navigate and um, particularly across different sectors so i found um for example that when working with big organizations like schools or national campaigning um groups there was expectations that the Pancare Centre had more support and expertise in house than we did. You know, I lost count of the number of times that myself and my colleague, who was there two days a week, looked at each other and just said, it's just us. Um, so, with high, hindsight, I would have been clearer um, about this at Project Start and have allowed more time to map out exactly how much time we would have needed to develop um, and problem solve, um, particularly for the session at the centre. The second thing I would have been done slightly differently is to be very specific about the types of young people we wanted to engage and why. Um, in the end, it didn't really matter because we were able to engage huge numbers of, of diverse young people. But those that were involved were those people who were already actively engaged um, in some form of political engagement. So some of them were part of their kind of diversity or debate groups at school, um, they might have been taking a local history class, um, or they were part of a more kind of politically engaged youth group. Um, this wasn't part of the project design, although actually focusing on interest groups like this would have been quite a good engagement strategy. Um, but this was a self-selecting thing because these were the groups that the teachers and youth leaders were selecting to take part. Uh, and interestingly, we found that schools, because it was a, a project that focused primarily on women's campaigning, uh, we found that schools were often identifying young women for the project, although we were clear that it was open to all young people um, of all genders. Um, and actually we had some really engaged young men who had some really insightful comments to make about their own um, gendered expectations and roles. Um, but you know, if the purpose of the project was to increase political participation of young people, uh, then we would need to be reaching beyond these individuals to young people who were less engaged with history, heritage and politics. Um, but that's for another project. Um, the last point is about legacy. So the project was a real success. You know, we ticked off all the project activity and the feedback suggests that young people got a huge amount from it and really enjoyed it. Uh, we also had huge amounts of learning from an organisational point of view, um, particularly about the sessions at the Pancare Centre, but we don't have much that really captured those sessions other than um, photographs um, and the evaluation reports, which it's, it's difficult to sort of know what to do with. Um, so the film that I showed you earlier about the last event uh, day of the project is a really lovely reminder of that day and I have used that several times since then and it would be nice to have that for different project activity. Similarly, the young people put together some really powerful campaigns on some important issues and whilst there are photographs of some of this material, material uh, I think it would have been nice to have documented their campaigns more fully. Um, we did do a social media takeover during the hack day at the People's History Museum uh, and also had a live event with MPs, uh, but I think it would have been nice to have connected the young people uh, with groups working on similar campaigns to ensure a kind of take up and a, a consistency beyond the scope of the project. And again, um, although the project put together a toolkit for schools and youth groups to be able to run their own sessions, we didn't consider how people would let us know about how those sessions went. Um, so that's something for us to think about too. Um, so I think that's an argument uh, for thinking about legacy um, from, from the very beginning of the project. And I think that's particularly key for projects which focus on youth engagement, uh, because it's really their voices and their development that's that's the whole point so to pull uh that lot together uh, and to try and make some kind of general points i think my top tips would be to work with people who know what you're what they're doing um to know your own strengths and be confident in the power of your heritage to provide a variety of opportunities for young people to engage to be honest and realistic about the time that these things take uh, to be specific about which young people and why uh, and to think about legacy from the very beginning of the project so i hope that's been helpful and do get in touch if you're interested in digital heroes i think one of the most powerful um and interesting 
comments during Tessa's um, video that she shared with us, it was a video within a video, um, was the lady that said it was an opportunity to power up the next generation. And I think many of us in the heritage sector aspire um, to do just that, but we might be scared of, of taking the plunge. Um, but as Pippa, I think it was Pippa said at the start, failure is fine. Give it a go. Give it a try. Um, so I just want to move up. We've only got really 10 minutes left for uh, questions. Charlotte, I'm afraid, has had to go back to work. Um, so she won't be here. Tessa's not here because she's on holiday. Um, but if you do have any questions, please do put your virtual hand up, um, unmute yourself and ask away. Does anybody have any questions for our presenters? And we'll keep an eye on the chat box as well. Can I come with a really basic one? Go for it, Sarah. Um, I'm just really conscious. Pippa and Hope, at the beginning, you both started by um, describing your appearance. And that's the first time I've heard that. Was that, is that an accessibility thing of just maybe helping people with um, eyesight challenges? Is that just a new, a new standard we should be adopting? Um, I'll go in that one. I saw it at one of the presentations and I thought that just as you've got Otter AI that is transcribing, um, it's important to, in, to understand the identity of the person that is talking. So just as my pronouns, I find them really valuable in terms of going she, her, ella because of my Spanish background, I think it's a really good and useful way of making sure that people from the start know who you are. So yeah, I definitely recommend adopting it, but I can also take feedback if you think that it's not useful. <laughs> no, that was great. And thank you for explaining it a bit. Brilliant. We do have a, a question in the chat box from Jill Fenny. Uh, she said, hi, I would be interested in understanding what provisions need to be in place to work with young people, safeguarding, insurance, et cetera. I was actually in the throes of writing a response in the chat box there. <laughs> Shall I just say what go I was going to say? Yeah, go for it, Kate. Yeah, so I was going to recommend that if you get in, in touch with a good insurance broker, um, like in Scotland, Keegan and Penny Kid, who we use, very experienced working with charities, and they should be able, as well as providing you with the necessary insurance, um, and that's really important, they should be able also to advise you on and, and demand to see um, the, the really legally required basic um, policies and procedures and so on that you need. Um, and there'd be more that, you know, may, if you are a charity, you can look on Oscar um, if you're in Scotland or what is it, the Charities Commission commissioner in England um, and they would be able to advise you as well but yes certainly depending on <clears throat> on the work you're doing you need more more or less of those more, more or fewer um, but uh, certainly the insurance insurance um, brokers that work with with the sector should be able to advise you on the basics and definitely get covered for insurance. That's brilliant Kate great advice thank you. Um, Catherine Knowles in the chat box has said, how did you first engage with groups working with young people? How did you establish those connections, maybe coming from a position where you haven't engaged with them before? Those first tentative steps. If I could hope. come in um, on that yeah. one, and I think Hope will echo uh, my thoughts here. I find that they come to us. Um, so it, we've had an overwhelming amount of work experience requests and placements and the young people are very, very keen to, to just join us. So keep hold of those contacts, guide them to that newsletter that you've got to communicate with people regularly and th th they'll come. Well, at least that's what, what we've experienced at Derby Museums. Um, Hope, would you agree? Yeah, I definitely would. Um, actually, yeah, this this year in particular, we've seen an unprecedented amount of people applying to um, to to help with the museums, whether for work experience. Um, Duke of Edinburgh is another really big one this year as well. I think more young people are taking part in that, and so they do come to us quite organically, um, and we're quite lucky in that sense. 
Um, other ways as well that, that we've, we've done it in the past is reaching out to local universities and colleges, um, you know, going in, doing talks if you're able to do that, if you've got the capacity to do that, um, sending information and in newsletters, if not, and hoping that the teachers will do so. Um, but definitely the relevant courses within the local colleges and universities is a really good place to start as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, I had a question, uh, which was initially for Charlotte and Chiara and Josie, but I think it it suits all, all of our panellists, really, in various different ways. But how did the young people communicate between themselves, between meetings or actually being on site together? Um, I mean, I don't know, Kate, if your young people do communicate when they're away from the ridge or... I'd just be interested to know, you know, whether they do. There's any. There's nothing formal. I think that, that happens between our youngsters. Um, I'm sure they all, um, in, in friendship groups, have their own sort of social media interactions. Probably Snapchat each other or something. Um, but but they don't have a sort of formal means of that I'm aware of of co communicating about their involvement at the ridge. It's not. That's just not the sort of setup that we've got um, mm. for their interactions. Well, I think Josie can reply to this one a bit better than me, but obviously there is an, an online system that young people use called the Hive. Um, and I'm sure, yeah, Josie, you can say a bit more about that. So there's actually constant communication uh, amongst the young people. And we are definitely encouraging that, especially since we pivoted, you know, starting in 2020 before COVID, then we pivoted to all virtual throughout COVID. That was certainly a really good platform to use. Yeah, so we, at Young Spokes, we have lots of um, we have lots of volunteers, but we also have lots of different projects. Since lockdown and going everything going digitally, which we didn't necessarily engage with as much before, which is definitely a bonus. On a side note, um, now we can bring young people from all over Scotland, including things like out, out at Hebrides and right down to the borders, all in one place. Whereas obviously, if you're doing face to face work, that becomes a lot more complicated, bringing everyone from um, big spaces out into the middle. But yeah, so we we mostly use at the moment um, a platform called Basecamp. And Basecamp is basically a interactive online bit of software um, that's really for project planning but it has lots of other interactive elements that young people will be used to because it's a bit like social media so you have kind of like a, a wall of kind of um, information and events that you can put lots of key details in you've got a calendar you've got a chat space um, there's lots of kind of different interactive ways that they can communicate on that space but most importantly for us it's also safe um, because we have young people as young as 11, but maybe as old as 25, um, we don't necessarily want um, unsupervised communication necessarily happening between all of those different age, age groups when you've got children and you've got adults interacting. So Basecamp is a safe space for us to bring them together to have that communication without necessarily having maybe a WhatsApp group, which could get complicated unless we were part of it. Um, so that's generally how we'll communicate, but we're always looking for ways to improve um, and we've got your, your standard, your, your texts, your calls, um, your emails as well, but that is our central space. That's really good to know. Thank you, Josie. We've got a, a question from uh, Sandra Deans from the John Ray Society, a question for Pippa. When describing the project, she said that they accessed a facilitator. Uh, want to know who that was or what the brief was? I don't know if you want to uh, yeah. unmute yourself, Sandra. I think, um, so linking to the first question that was asked in terms of like what you need in addition to insurance and all the right paperwork, I would say money. You make, need to make sure that there, is, there are funds associated to the project of working with young people. Um, it's not something that can just happen um, if you don't have the right leaders. As Hope mentioned in the presentation, it's really, we thought that it was really important to have young staff members also as part of the team so that their voices were heard but they were staff members and they were paid for their time in doing that. And we had a variety of facilitators. We involved um, the head curator of Joseph Wright, uh, the, the 
Joseph Wright paintings. Um, we, we had myself and there was a lead and assistant coordinator for the Young Co-Producers Network. So it's, you need to bring people with you and make sure that there are resources, financial resources for that project. That's what I would say. Thank you, Pippa. Anybody else got any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. Vicky had um, put in the chat box oh. about celebrating people's wins. And I think it was in relation to um, Kate's point about making sure that they really get qualifications out of it. But um, Vicky was also noting that particularly with Duke of Edinburgh, there's lots of um, badges and certificates, all that kind of stuff. And just about the value of that as well. So I don't know what the others, um, the other speakers do for celebrating people. Anyone hold out, hand out gold stars for their young people? Because I imagine there's still, there's still a place for that. I think, yeah, Kate's point about if you can give them a qualification, brilliant, that is fantastic. But there are still, you know, there's those levels of celebrating people with a certificate and events and thanking them are still really valid. Yeah, so I, I just to come back in on that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be um, sort of dismissive of, of other sorts of um, ways of celebrating success. Celebrating success is really important. And, um, and I think sometimes for us, it's just about taking the time at the end of a session to say, well, look, let's have a look at what the group or a particular individual has done. And, you know, let's let's admire this lovely piece of, you know, letter carving that somebody's done on their first ever day holding a chisel. Um, and, and let's, you know, celebrate that. I mean, you know, we wouldn't couch it in those terms, but, you know, you'll, you'll get a sense for the, the youngsters you're working with and the right sort of language and, um, and so on. Um, but I just, I think on the contrary, I wasn't saying don't don't celebrate I was saying and, and don't unless it's accredited I was saying it is really important to do that and I think as well you know having having people that they uh, whose whose feedback they really value um, is really really powerful so whether that's just you know people from the local community walking down the the lane and seeing their work and saying wow thank you for doing this it's so amazing um, unforced you know natural spontaneous um, praise like that or whether it's Darren winning his award from the community council and that appearing in the local paper on social media or or whether it's ministers who have come to visit the, the wider project who take the time to speak to them and admire what they're doing. I just I, I think that, you know, for youngsters, particularly the sort we work with, we're not used to getting, um, you, you know, praise and and uh, positive feedback for successes uh, where school has not been a place where they've experienced success, that we have opportunities to, to celebrate um, different sort of successes and to celebrate it in different ways and the, the, the kind of real world um, you know, feedback that we can provide is extremely powerful um, for, in, in that sort of context. Thanks, Kate. Um, we've got one more question um, that will take from Jill Fenny in the chat, chat box because people have started to... Sorry, Beth, Kiara's got her hand up, so I think that was probably oh, a response to the same topic. Go for it, Kiara. Thank you. Yeah, it was very, very quick. Just to say, completely agree. I think from experience, what young people what young people said to us, I think the, the best way to celebrate is recognition, being taken seriously. I think this is what Charlotte said as well. An example, I mentioned this project that we did with the young skaters in Livingston. And these young people wanted to celebrate their skate park. They did it in a different way. Um, one was getting that recognized as heritage officially. And that's how that went on to Canmore. They were boasting about it. They loved that. They made a video and this video was extremely popular all, uh, you know, with thousands and thousands of views in the community and beyond. And it was actually uh, toured around this video uh, as part of Made in My Tune, which was a BBC like traveling cinema that was shown in different cities. And there were the guest speakers when it actually showed in Livingston. Uh, so they had the Q&A discussion, the skaters, like, you know, film directors. So it's things like that um, is the recognition 
of the ideas that are taken seriously and just um, really understanding that some, that's something that is important for them and that's recognised. That, that's brilliant. It must have been a great event in Livingston. I can imagine. Um, so people are just starting to, to leave now. It's lunchtime, so it's inevitably we're going to lose some people. Uh, we've just got the one more question from Jill asking, does anyone measure the stick rate of young volunteers? I'm imagining she means the, the dropout. Um, I don't know if any of our panellists measure that at all. This is no. something that Josie and I talk about sometimes because <laughs> uh, we start, um, you know, we, we re-recruit uh, on the youth forum regularly to make sure that there is that, that those new voices, obviously some young people drop out because of, you know, we get an extension. Some young people can't commit any further from the original deadline. And then people just drop out throughout, you know, the, the actual project. So um, re-recruiting something that we do. And would you say, Josie, what's the dropout? Maybe half pretty much sometimes even it can be as high as half i would say it's yeah. a third um mm. i think there's a, there's a few things at play here and it's something to bear in mind when you're engaging with young people is true engagement that involves something like co-design or co-production or a person-centered approach it's probably going to take a bit of time it's definitely going to take money as pef has already said it does take a lot of your cash so funding is key um but because it takes time that means that you get young people in um going through stages of their lives and that might be exams it might be mental health issues it might be moving house it, you know there's all the things that happen to us as human beings also happens to young people and that can mean that unfortunately they just can't give their time to you anymore because with us of course they're volunteers they're not getting paid for their time and they're giving us their really valuable time and insight so we have to kind of bear that in mind when we're um, putting in proposals for um for projects and thinking about how long that project's going to take so as Kiara said this project um is now into kind of the, the third year in, in a way really of the project and we've had to um, recruit halfway through but we expected to do that we expected to have um, young people fall off and we kind of take that into account when we're thinking about what's going to happen on this project so I always advise over recruit because that's going to help you out in the long run. And there's also an element of different type of engagement as well because some young people are totally engaged and hands-on and very present and visible because of their time commitment, their just their style in general. And I think some young people want to be engaged, just don't have the time for it, the, that sort of, um, sort of headspace for it. And I think that's something that Josie and I, and I found quite a lot as well. They totally are in love with the project, they want to be involved, but they just can't be present as much as other people. So there's different levels of engagement as well. Thank you both. Yeah. If possible, sorry, just to add to that as well. I, th I think if you're able to um, to um, rate success not on on the sticking count or on you know how many you recruit at first, but on um, you know their experiences with you, like like for example, you know we have volunteers that are doing Duke of Edinburgh and we know full well that they will come. They will give six weeks where they'll come and give an hour or two of their time, and then they will most likely stop. And that is OK. Um, it, it's hard, especially when obviously so much is about data and so much is about numbers these days. But if you can sort of accept that, you know, most likely that will be their only interaction with us, that is fine. But maybe years down the line when they're looking at career options, they might go, I had a really good experience at Darwin Museums. Maybe I'd like to do my work experience there. And then maybe that will lead to I might want to do more of this. There's a job going. I might apply for it. You know, I think it's that. Um, you know, if you can just inspire and engage and have meaningful engagement, then sometimes that is better than what, how long they're with you for. Um, then, I, yeah, that was my my bit to add. Brilliant, thank you, Hope. Some absolutely great points from all of our panelists this morning. I hope you've all enjoyed this event. I think it's it's been absolutely packed full of really really useful and important information for going forward with working with young adults um, we will be putting the recording of this event on our website if you want to share it with any of your colleagues um, and i'll be dropping you all an email uh, this afternoon i think asking you if you could just fill in a very short feedback form for us as obviously this is lottery funded um, and we need the feedback 
Um, and if anyone wants to ask any further questions, do re respond to that email that I send you and, and I'll get in touch with the panelists and ask, um, I'll send them your questions. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you, Sarah, for, for helping behind the scenes. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. Hopefully we'll see you again at a, a future event. Bye.